Everybody gets good or fun. We like to help. There are a lot of lessons you can draw from that video. The one that I want to draw out this morning is that the spectators can hear you. Maybe you can turn the the go button. Yeah. <laughs> is that better? It makes a difference. The spectators did not have the same passion or vision that the leader did. And they did not grasp the mission that their leader had. And it's just as there are many who do not have the passion that Jesus called us to have for lost people. And there are many who do not understand his mission when he says that we are to go out and be fishermen. And that is the crisis in the Christian church. It is the crisis in the Adventist church. The misunderstanding of God's mission for us, of not clearly understanding who God is and what his mission is for us as a church and for us as individuals. It is a crisis of a false view of God. You probably didn't see that coming in the video, did you? In fact, you may wonder if we watch the same video. You thought this was about fishing. It's really about understanding the mission of God and understanding who God is. Because as long as we are, as long as we're content or comfortable to be deceived by Satan as to who God truly is and to what his mission is and what our role is in his mission. We'll be here another 150 years. Just think when, when Adam and Eve gave birth to their first child, to Cain. Cain, Cain, excuse me. They had no idea that another 7,000 years would pass and we would still be stranded on this planet. But when we do understand who God is, when we have that picture that He wants us to see, the picture that's painted for us in His Word, we find great joy and peace in being in His presence. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to enjoy all of the emotions that God wants us to have Emotions of joy and peace and gratitude and compassion. Generations have passed and we're still here. And as we, as we get nearer and nearer to the end of time, there are, Satan is trying to pressure us to be content with a false view of who God is. We desperately need our hearts anchored and sustained by an outrageous love that God has for us. To be contaminated, if we could use that word, to be filled with, with God's love, His unconditional love, and to be able to express that and to radiate that to those around us. You and I cannot produce good enough argument to change God's unconditional love for us. But the present crisis in God's remnant church is that many people never experience God's unconditional love. They never experience passionate spirituality because of their false view of God. Instead of seeing a God who is full of tenderness, was full of gladness 
was full of joy. They imagine a God who has animosity toward them. And it impacts every aspect of their life. To put it in practical terms, if you had a meeting with somebody who's coming up, and you knew this person didn't like you, you knew this person saw you as a hypocrite, you'd be looking at your watch wondering, how soon can we get the meeting over? And how soon can we get back to doing the things we really like to do? And that's how many people view their relationship with God. They worship God with guarded spirit and with closed hearts. They see God as a being who walks around with a big stick, just waiting to pounce upon you. And they're unable to worship Him with an open heart and an open spirit because they they feel rejected by God. They sense that they're just walking through the motions of being a Christian. They may use different words to express their pain. They may pray, they may sing, they may read their Bibles, but their hearts are latched shut. And there's a sign hanging over their heart that says, do not disturb. It's hard to go to a God that you perceive who despises you. And yet there are many in the church today who see God that way. They see him as, as Jonathan Edwards describes, man in the hands of an angry God. They're like mules lugging around huge loads of condemnation on their back. Even though Paul said in Romans 8, 1, therefore there was now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And even though we read those words and we mentally believe them, we find ourselves listening to Satan say, that doesn't include you. That doesn't mean you. You are condemned. Or what Paul says in Romans 5, when we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And the devil says to many Seventh-day Adventists, that doesn't include you. Many Adventists see themselves as prisoners on spiritual probation. And they try so hard to get their act together. Sometimes they find themselves saying, Lord, just give me one more chance and, and I won't make that mistake again. Just give me one more chance. Or they say, Lord, forgive me one more time and I'll never sin that way again. You ever found yourself praying that way? And you know, in the back of your mind, you're going to sin that way again. They try continuously to create a loving God. But when you and I cannot create what already exists, a loving God. Throughout the world, there are many Seventh-day Adventists who live in spiritual compromise. The cause of their view of God, the cause of their false view of God. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 3. In verse 14. The translation that I'm using says, Turn, O backsliding children. That's what like what God puts things. He first with us as children. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married to you, and I will take you one city at a time, two families, and I will bring you into Zion. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. God is calling to his backsliding people in the time of Israel, in the time today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So what is he going to do? Hit us over the head with a club? Or bring the Great Depression back? 
or cause a military invasion of the United States, or maybe spread some incurable disease to get us to fall in love with him. He says, I am married to you. Do you remember when you got married? Remember how amazing that was? I hope it was amazing for you. I heard a couple of chuckles that made me wonder. Johnny Erickson Tata remembered her wedding day. And it started with tragedy. Not just the tragedy of her becoming a quadriplegic, but she was she was in her wedding dress. She was going to ride her motorized wheelchair down the aisle into her waiting soon-to-be husband. But somehow the wheel caught her dress and caused a tear in it. And not only was that bad enough, but it also left grease stain on her dress. And the flowers that were in her lap had fallen between her legs and she was a quadriplegic. She couldn't pick them up. And she was so filled with disappointment. But when the doors opened and she saw Ken, her husband, to be, everything changed. She was not focused on the terror dress or the grease or the flowers. She was focused on the man who was committing his life to love her forever. Worshiping Christ. When we see Christ for who he is, that's all that matters. And that's what God is longing for us. To see him through the eyes of Jesus. God doesn't wail on us for the switch. And I remember a kid growing up, my grandparents and my parents were good at getting the switch. But he introduces himself in the context of a marriage. I am married to you. I am passionately in love with you. And I want you to be in love with me. Jeremiah 3, he's inviting us to fall in love with him, to be passionately spiritual for him. He beckons us to go on a journey that we will experience the power, the power of victory, the power of love, the power of joy. And that will be so contagious that we want to share with other people. We want others to know what an amazing God He is. We become proclaimers of the great news of salvation through Christ. We become people seeking after God's own heart. Flip over to chapter 3 of Jeremiah. Excuse me. Up to verse 15. You're already Jeremiah 3. Says, I will give you, this verse says, I will give you shepherds. You know, Jesus used the metaphor of fishermen. So he said, I'll give you fishermen according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. God is wanting every one of us to be his fishermen, to feed on his love, to be transformed by his grace, and then to share with others. What an amazing God we serve. He wants us to be like a river that flows in its, that's refreshing on a hot summer day. It makes life just so amazing. And then he, he doesn't want us to bottle it up, but he wants us to share it. He wants us to love him the way he loves us, and then he wants us to love others the way. God loves us. Jeremiah 3, God is saying, He will rise up people, men and women and children, who will be passionately spiritual for Jesus, who will be equipped because of their encounter with Him. 
Daniel prophesied this when he said, and those of the people who understand, that is understand God's heart, shall instruct many. Remember the video, people kept saying, we really don't have time, we're not really interested. God wants a people who are so interested because they're filled with his love. They're seeking his heart. When Jeremiah prophesied that God was going to raise up men and women after his own heart, that was 600 B.C. Now Mary Jane said that was a long time ago when she was a kid. 600 B.C., that was really a long time ago. And the Lord borrowed this phrase that he gave to us, his servant, a young guitar player, I like you, Bob, from the Black Hills of Bethlehem. He said in 1 Samuel 13, The Lord has sought out for himself a man who is loyal to him, and the Lord has appointed him to be the leader of his people. Remember that expression? David, a man after God's own heart. And it wasn't Samuel who said this, it was God who spoke through Samuel. That he wanted a man who was after God's own heart. And 400 years later, God echoes this when he says to his prophet Jeremiah, I will raise up people in the end times, that's the time we live in today, who will be like David will be lovers of God's heart. But before, even before David's experience, 750 B.C., a young prophet named Hosea would say, at the time, he, at the time declares the Lord, you will call my husband, and you will never again call me master. God is longing for us to have that love relationship of husband and wife. Now, I know there are challenges that I've for because some marriages are not too good. Too many marriages end up broken. But God is looking at the perfect, the ideal relationship where two people are amazingly in love with each other. And God is saying that his people in the end of time will have that same character that David had. They'll be seekers of God's heart. God is raising up fishermen to share with others this good news. They will share what they've experienced. And some people are afraid to share because they're not sure they have the right answers. But what God needs us to share is how he has changed us, how he has transformed us, how we have fallen in love with him. Some will do it through songs. Some will do it through preaching. Some will do it through Bible studies. Some will do it at work, sharing with people. How God has transformed us. When people say, what makes you different? I say, well, nothing really except that God loves me. And I love you because God loves you. And for us to do that, for us to, to share that kind of love, we need to spend time with God. Amen? Spend time with His Word. Spend time with Him. Enjoying that relationship. You remember when you first fell in love? And you call on the phone and talk for hours. You know, it's too many couples have forgotten how valuable that was. And there are many couples who need to go back to calling each other on the phone leaving love notes. And 
part of this problem, right? Part of this crisis we have with the church is compromising with the world. Being more comfortable in the world than we are with Jesus Christ. We need to be more open to the Spirit's leading so that we can have a passionate spiritual relationship with our Lord. Because it's not enough to tell people that God is the bridegroom. We need to tell them we're the bride. And that He's in love with us. And there's nothing that we can do to stop Him from loving us. To remind people that God has not forgotten His people. And that He is in love with us like He was in love with David. Now you look at David's life and you might say, well David, was, he's like us. He was weak. And he had spiritual failures. And he was many things. He was a shepherd, a psalmist, a king, a liar, and a murderer. But most important of all, he is the only person in the entire Bible that is described as a man after God's own heart. And that's the kind of man and woman God wants us to be. You see, before Jesus can come, Before Revelation 14, 12 will be fulfilled, here is the patience of the saints. Here they either keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We need to fall in love with God again. Amen. We need to come to a place where we, we can't stand to be away from Him. Can't imagine four more stunning words than a man after God's heart. Yes, he was full of doubts. And yes, there was sin in his life. And yet God singled him out as a man after his heart. That is the most amazing compliment that God could give to anybody. And that's the compliment he wants to give to us because we have fallen in love again with him. And we're not listening to Satan's deceptions. We're not listening to Satan's condemnations. We're not listening to Satan's outlining all of our sins. Because we know that Jesus has forgiven us of those sins. We know that Jesus has cleansed us of our unrighteousness. And we know that Jesus is preparing us for the way. Paul said in Acts 13, he, referring to God, he says, He raised up for them David as king. And said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And I love the way God edits. He said all these nice things about, about David. The devil was saying, excuse me, sir, I have some issues. God edited out all that stuff. Because he had already forgiven David. And he edits out in our life as well. He does not keep a record. A husband and wife went to a marriage counselor. And the wife dragged her husband there. And one day the counselor said to the husband, What's the problem? He said, The problem is my wife is historical. He said, Don't you mean hysterical? He said, No, she's historical. Every mistake I've ever made. She reminds me. That's where the devil is. He's historical. He's constantly reminding us of all of our mistakes. And we fall in the trap of listening to those. God has already forgiven those. We don't have to live in the past. We don't need to have those mules hauling all of our past baggage. When we look at the life of David, we can say, Lord, me too. I want to be a man or woman after God's own heart. We are the generation that bears the distinction of being ready for the soon coming of Jesus. 
Let's not settle for winning another, another 150 years. But let's be minimum after God. You okay with that? You okay with telling the devil no? Reminding that we have been, that there is no condemnation to us? Because God has already forgiven those things? So when he reminds you of your mistakes, remind him of his future. <laughs> when he reminds you of your mistakes, remind him to look to Jesus. Because Jesus clothes us with his righteousness. And he cleanses us of our sins. And makes it possible for us to let go of our past and be men and women who seek after God's heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've been here for 7,000 years, Lord. Help us to let go of all of the devil's lies and fall amazingly in love with you. Help us be ready for the wedding because it's so spectacular. Help us to fall in love with you every day. Help us to come to the place where we cannot spend, we cannot endure spending time away from you because we're so much in love. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's close with 430.